You are listening to Beaver Tales, Volume 1, The Secret Laboratory, by Studio Mike. Introduction I dive to the earth as buckshot soars past my ear. We're empty-handed as we return from a uranium run, our lives hanging in the balance. We won't be time-traveling tonight. Get up! Freddy calls to me. He bends down and pulls me to my feet. Freddy the Frog, a.k.a. the Trickster, hops ahead of me. The shimmery pond is just ahead of us, but it'll be a miracle if we get there before we're filled with buckshot. Another blast roars overhead, and I duck. Pumpkin ducks, too. Pumpkin is my girl and is a beaver, just like me. At least, I hope she's my girl. We haven't really talked about it, but this probably isn't the best time to bring it up as Farmer Anders continues to shoot at us with his shotgun. I hear vicious barking, and I shiver as I recognize the timbre of the hideous beast, Dreadnought, the farmer's protective half-wolf, black shepherd that strikes fear in me with his bloodshot eyes and long, sharp fangs. I can hear the pounding of his giant paws on the earth behind me, and I know if we don't make it to the pond quick, we're as good as dead. Pumpkin, move it! He's right behind you! I can feel my heart beating in my throat. I'm too terrified to turn around. One wrong step, and I'm dead. Freddy makes it to Shimmery Pond first, and dives under the surface of the mossy water. Pumpkin and I dive in right behind him. The water is cold and I shiver. BBs slide past us under the surface of the water, and it's enough to make me gasp and choke on tepid water. And I know what you're thinking. What do beavers, uranium, and time travel have in common? Well, that's a heck of a story. So, if heck of a stories are your thing, Settle in and buckle up, because you're in for a heck of a ride. Chapter 1. The Nightmare Every morning, I wake up from the same nightmare. A fire roars all around me, and I can't move. Our house is on fire, and I'm trapped under a burning log. I can feel the heat of the flames as they curl the hair on the top of my head. I smell burning fur. I scream for my parents, but my voice is silent. No words come out. I'm blinded by black, acrid smoke as two strong paws pull me from the roaring fire. Don't worry, worry. you're safe now, now. a voice tells me. I'm carried to safety and placed under the wet leaves of an overgrown elm tree. I clear my eyes and watch as Pa heads back to our burning den and disappears into the firestorm. I yell for him to come back, but he can't hear my cries. I try to stand up and follow him when I'm thrown back from a powerful explosion. I hit the ground with a thud and am left breathless. Chapter 2. Seeger's Square Pa! I cry out and wake up in bed, soaked in sweat. I look around my blackened room and realize I've had the nightmare again. I wipe tears from my eyes and lay back down. No matter how many times I have that dream, it never fails to shake me to my core. It's as vivid today as it was the day it happened. And the gut-wrenching loss I feel every time I realize that Ma and Pa are still gone is devastating. Maybe it's time I introduce myself. My name is Rain. I'm an 11-year-old beaver with soft brown fur, a long, leathery tail, and teeny little ears. I live in a den that my relatives built years ago and that our family has lived in for as long as anyone can remember. Our den is built into the mouth of Shimmery Pond, a deep, dark pond that is bisected by the Big Muddy River, which flows through the property of our arch enemy, Farmer Anders. Every year, Farmer Anders tries to blow up our den 
because of all the flooding and damage our home causes his fields and farm. He is the one who killed my parents five years ago, and he is the one I long to rid from our lives forever. I live in our den with my twin older sisters, Hope and Meadow, and my grandparents, Nana and Pop Pop. I also have a pet catfish named Curly. He's not really my pet, but my best friend, and I'd trust him with my life. Though Pop Pop can be a grumpy old beaver, he rarely smiles or says a kind word. Nana says it's because his heart was broke when my father was killed in the blast that destroyed our old den. Nana is the sweetest beaver you could ever hope to meet. She is loving, thoughtful, and I love her with every ounce of my being. Though my older sisters are twins, they couldn't be more different. Hope is outgoing, cheerful, and brilliant. She is amazing at math, physics, and works with electronics. She is fascinated by technology, just like Pa was. Pa was a brilliant inventor, and Hope takes after him in a lot of ways. Meadow is a mute. She's introverted and has no interest in math or technology. She'd rather sit in the garden and work with her plants than sit inside and fiddle with computers. Ma loved gardening and cooking, and Meadow, who is cute and dimple-cheeked, takes after her and loves to spend time with Nana, whom she idolizes. For the most part, we live a peaceful and tranquil life. On weekends, we go to Humble Village, where Nana has a stand where she sells cakes, muffins, and her specialties, pond lily soup, and birch bark muffins. Humble Village is a small town located downriver from Shimmery Pond. You can get anything in Humble Village, from preserves and cakes to beer and weaponry. Nana always makes sure to keep us on the right side of the river and away from all the bad folks. I always enjoy our weekend trips to the village because that's where I get to see my crush, Pumpkin, a green-eyed cutie with a sweet smile and a laugh that is like music to my ears. She works with her big brother, Billy Bob, at Bumpkins, a small soda shop that serves the village's vast clientele. I always pop in for a visit, a hug, and for a fizzy drink whenever I'm in town. Her parents are rarely around, preferring to spend their time in the local pub, the Sandy Bottom, gambling away the few earnings they earn from their fledgling soda shop. I dream of a day when I can take her away with me and we can live happily ever after. Though my sisters are a lot like my parents were, I have neither the fortitude for math and sciences that my pa had, nor the artistic talents that my ma possessed. I often felt like the odd man out and spent more time with my friends than family, something that I regret to this day. But how was I to know my parents would be taken from me at such an early age? I like to write stories and play sports like water polo and stickball, and I especially love destroying stuff like Farmer Anders' fences. Farmer Anders. That awful human ruined our lives. He took my parents away from me, and life has never been the same as a constant sorrow hangs in the air inside our home. I stretch my paws toward the roof of my bedroom and yawn loudly. I jump out of bed and slip into my favorite pair of overalls. Though ripped and in dire need of Nana repair, they fit me like a second skin and I never go anywhere without them. They were a gift from my ma before her death and wearing them is like being hugged by her and I can't live without that feeling. There is a knock at my bedroom door. Rain and Tara, you getting up a what? It's my pop pop using the nickname he loves to tease me with. Come on, Stanky, get up. Hope calls through the door. It's our birthday, and Nana says we can't open our presents until you get out of bed. So get up! I'm coming, I say. Of course I know it's the twins' birthday, but I'll never tell her that. It might make her think I love her or something, and I can't have that. I open the door and take in the sense of mourning. I smell root tea and freshly baked lily pad muffins, and I hurry to the kitchen, where my family is sitting around the kitchen table. Pop Pop and Meadow sit at the table, stuffing their faces with grubs. Nana hovers around the stove, keeping everything in check. 
Sit down, honey. I'll serve you breakfast. Thanks, Nana. I'm starving. Now can we open our presents? Just one. But Nana said... You can open one. That's it. Hope tries to protest, but Pop-Pop is having none of it. She moves into the living room and approaches a table that is loaded with gifts wrapped in brightly colored paper. Aren't you going to open a gift, dear? Nana asks Meadow. The girl thinks about it, then gets up from the table and joins Hope in the living room. Nana, Pop-Pop, and I join the twins in the living room, leaving breakfast behind. I scurry back and grab a muffin and chomp down on it. Like always, it's super delicious. So good, I say. Don't talk with your mouth full. I open my mouth and show him my chewed up food. I stick my tongue out at him. Don't be gross, dear. I smile and finish the muffin. This is exciting. She picks up boxes with her name on it and shakes them. Sounds like a pair of slippers, she says, and puts the box down. This one sounds like a new dress. Meadow picks up a gift and walks back to the red sofa and sits down with it in her lap. Aren't you going to open it? Meadow looks up at her with giant, sympathetic eyes and looks back at her present. Just open it, I say. It's my gift, and I know she's going to love it. She slowly unwraps the paper and opens the box. A huge smile lights up her face, and she reaches into the box and pulls out a new set of paintbrushes. She rushes over to me and gives me a huge hug. It's uncomfortably long, but I'm filled with joy because I know that I've made her happy. Meadow goes back to the couch, sits down, and admires her gift. Hope continues shaking boxes. Hmm, I don't know what this one is. She shakes it again. Down the hall, there is a splashing noise and a figure emerges from the entrance to the den. It's an older, overweight beaver with a small bald patch on the top of his head. Uncle Uncle Cody. Cody! Hey, kiddos. Cody shakes himself off and water beads off his greasy fur and onto the entrance carpet. Shaking gifts again, eh, kid? He says to Hope and pats her on the head. She gives him a huge hug. Meadow waves to him from the couch. There's muffins and tea in the kitchen. Nana tells Uncle Cody. I race him to the kitchen and we stuff our mouths with warm, tasty pastry. He smiles at me and pats me on the back. Uncle Cody was Pa's business partner and they worked together in an old laboratory below our den. Since Pa's death, he has spent a lot of time at our house and has become somewhat of a surrogate father to my sisters and I. We walk into the living room where Hope has finally selected a gift to open. What is it? I don't know, Stinky. I haven't opened it yet. Don't call your brother Stinky! If he doesn't want to be called Stinky, he should try using soap. In her hands is a small box wrapped in purple paper. Who's it from? It doesn't say. She flips the gift over and there is a small label with her name on it. She stares at it for a long moment and doesn't say anything. Open it. Don't rush me. She rips the paper from the gift and reveals a brown wooden box with three horizontal stripes and a big S carved into the top. What is it? I don't know. I give her a sidelong glance because I know that's not the case. She looks at me with a glare that says to keep my mouth shut. Let me see that thing. She hands it over, and I look at my sister and wonder why she's pretending not to know that it's a Seeger's Square, a novelty toy that my pa designed. It can be used to hide things that you don't want others to find. Let me see. He looks at the Seeger's Square and flips it over a couple times. I think it's a puzzle or something. Hope takes the square from him, and walks off. Meadow gets up and follows Hope into the bedroom, and they close the door. Does that mean she likes it or not? They're teenagers, so your guess is as good as mine. I'll go check on them, I say. I go to their room and knock on the door. Go away. Why are you pretending you don't know what that is? Shh. Get in here. Hope pulls me inside the room and closes the door. Meadow is sitting on the lower bed of their walnut bunk beds. 
She's inspecting the square. What's going on? I ask. I think it's a gift from Pa. Uh, that's not possible. He's the only one that ever had a Seeger square. Meadow nods. Are you saying you think he's still alive? No, I mean, I don't know. But where did it come from? The three of us stare at the square, clueless to its origins. I take the square from Meadow. Well, if it is from Pa, why would he send it to you? And why now? I'm not sure. Let's see what's inside. To get the Seeger square open, she slides the top square to the right. She does the same thing with the other two sections until the square now looks like a 12-point star. Then she flips it back over and a small door opens in the top of the square. What's that? I ask. I don't know. I haven't opened it yet. She reaches into the small compartment and pulls out a thin glass vial with a black top. She inspects it. Meadow gets up from the bed and takes the vial from Hope. She shakes it until a small scroll slides out and into her paw. Is that a note? I ask. Meadow hands it over and I unfurl the scroll. What's going on in there? Pop Pop opens the door and instinctively I hide the scroll. Uncle Cody is standing behind him. You guys gonna spend all day in there? There are plenty of presents that still need to be opened. We'll be out in a minute. She closes the door and comes back to inspect the scroll. What does it say? In small black script, script that could only be written by Pa, the scroll says, Under the old crier where we used to count sheep and bask in the sunlight until we would sleep. I hand it over to Hope. She reads it a couple times. What does that mean? I ask. It's a riddle. From Pa. How could Pa send you a puzzle? Meadow shrugs her shoulders. I don't know. But that's his writing, isn't it? Yes, I say. I recognized it right away. Well, he's trying to tell us something. But what? I try and decipher the riddle, but come up empty. It's too early for puzzles. You're being rude! Pop Pop calls through the door. We're coming! She slides the scroll back into the vial. She puts the vial in a small pocket in her white birthday dress. Then she closes up the square and puts it on the desk in the corner of their bedroom. We better get out of here before Pop Pop has a coronary. No one says anything about what we found. I know, I reply. She stops and looks me in the eye. Paul sent this to us for a reason. He wants us to find something. Think about what the riddle says and let me know if you come up with anything. I think of the riddle again. Under the old crier where we used to count sheep and bask in the sunlight until we would sleep. It means nothing to me, but I keep it at the back of my mind as we return to the living room. Chapter 3. Dreadnought Back in the living room, the elders are sitting around, waiting for us. I need you to do something for me. I thought I had everything I needed to make the girls their birthday feast, but I'm short a couple items. I need you to go to the village and pick them up for me, please? Of course, Nana. Whatever you need. Nana writes down what she needs on a scrap of paper. She needs blueberries, carrots, and potatoes. Nana opens a small black purse and pulls out a few silver coins. This should cover it. If anything is left over, you can buy yourself a treat, okay? Okay, Nana. Thanks. I shove the coins and list into my pocket and walk out of the kitchen. Where are you going? I'm going to town to get a couple things for Nana. I'll come with you. No, you won't. We need to get this place ready for the big party, and I need your help. I head to the entrance of the den and dive into the water. The water is cold from the winter thaw and I swim out from under the den and into the pond. The water is murky and a figure emerges from the bottom of the pond. I recognize the rotund figure of my best bud, Curly, the catfish. He follows me to the surface of the water. Where are you going? Nan needs me to get a couple things for her. Can I come with you? Can you walk on land? No. Then you can't come. But I want to. Then you're going to have to figure out a way to do it. I will. One of these days. You just wait. 
I've heard Curly say this a thousand times, and I'd love for my buddy to be able to follow me on land, but I haven't been able to figure out a way for him to do it. I bet Pa could have figured out a way to do it. Pa was a genius. I climb out of the water and shake myself off. I'll be back soon. Maybe we can play some stickball later. I'd love that. Okay, buddy. See ya. I walk off and up the sloppy shore to the pond. To my left, pussy willows are beginning to emerge from their winter sleep. I walk around the stick pile that hides our den underneath. I emerge at the mouth of the big muddy river and stand there. A gorgeous orange and black butterfly soars down from an old oak tree and lands on my shoulder. Good morning, Wayne. Hi, Penelope. Penelope is a monarch butterfly. She was orphaned on our land last year when her family were on their way to Mexico for their winter vacation. She got separated from her family and has been living with us on our land ever since. She is a sweet, caring friend who looks out for me, and I'm lucky to have her in my life. She's waiting around with the hope that her family will come back for her when summer emerges from the frozen cocoon of spring. Where are you going? I need to get some things for Nana. You going to the village? I hesitate. I've been thinking about that. I don't think so. I think I'll go shopping elsewhere, I reply. Oh, no, you won't. She scolds. You're not going there. You'll get in trouble. Did someone say trouble? From out of the river emerges a small green frog with big bulging eyes. Hey, Freddy. Don't call me that. I'm the trickster. I'm not going to call you that. It's dumb. It's not dumb. It's my stage name. But you don't perform anywhere. Not yet, I don't. But I will someday. Well, when that day comes, I'll start calling you that. Until then, you're just plain Freddy. Guess she told you, I say. He huffs loudly and I laugh. Where are you going? He's supposed to go into town and get some things for the party. What kind of things? Blueberries, carrots, and potatoes. Did your Nana give you coin for that stuff? Of course, I reply. Cool. What you really should do is pocket that money for later and go to the farmer's house instead. We can grab stuff there. Don't do it. Freddy, I like the way you think, I say with a smile. No, you don't. No, you won't. Stop being such a worrywart. We'll be fine. Yeah, we'll be fine, I say. To be honest, I had already been counting that money and fantasizing about all the cool things I could buy with it. It's too early. Nothing has grown in his fields. True, but he has stuff in his kitchen and in storage. You're not helping. Wasn't trying to. I know it's dangerous and that I could be putting my life in jeopardy by entering the farmer's property. At the same time, I despise him. I'll use any excuse to make his life miserable. It's one of my only goals in life, to make life so unbearable that he'll have to leave the property for good. Let's go, I say. To the village, right? Good try. I dive into the big muddy and swim across to the distant shore. Freddy follows me, and Penelope soars above us, scolding us the whole time. We climb up the riverbank and enter a small clearing. You can still turn around and do the right thing. The buds are emerging from their winter sleep as we walk on by. At the end of the clearing, we find a thin silver fence. It's the electric fence that Farmer Anders has built around his fields and orchards to keep us out. Don't touch it. Thanks for the warning, Miss Obvious. Freddy hops between the rows of thin wires and emerges on the other side, unharmed. Penelope flies over the fence and lands on the other side with the frog, her wings gently stirring in the wind. I lay down on my stomach and make myself as thin as possible. I probably shouldn't have eaten that fourth muffin, I mutter as I begin to slide under the bottom rung of the electric fence. Be careful. I slowly drag myself under the wire and make sure that my tail doesn't rise and get me electrocuted. Almost there! I crawl out from under the fence and dust myself off. See? No problem! You got lucky! One of these days you might get yourself hurt. Who invited her along? You need me. She sticks her tongue out at him. I can help keep you safe. I look around. To our right, there are rows of tall apple trees. 
most of which are starting to awake from their winter slumber. There are fruit and vegetable patches that the farmer has recently sowed. Early summer, there will be so many strawberries, I'll gorge until I get sick. And if I'm lucky, there will be ripe and delicious raspberries that I'll stuff into my mouth and enjoy as the sticky juice drips down my chin. Up ahead, there is a small sloping hill that leads to the farmer's house. The house is painted white and has a red door and green shutters. A graying wooden porch wraps around the house and holds two old rocking chairs that sit motionless. Let's move, I say, as we head up the muddy path that leads to the house. I'll go up ahead and let you know if I see anything. She soars ahead of us and rises high into the air for a better vantage point. Coast is clear. Freddy and I climb up the hill and head toward the house. Where should we go in? Back of the house. That's where the kitchen is. We sneak around to the back of the house. On the porch, there is a snoring old white basset hound with brown spots and two of the longest ears I've ever seen. Her name is Fanny. I motion to Freddy to keep quiet. We sneak by the snoring dog, not that we're too concerned about waking her. With her long ears, she can't move fast without tripping over them. It's actually quite comical to watch. No, I'm not worried about Fanny. It's the other dog I worry about, the dreaded Dreadnought. He's a vicious monster with big bloodshot eyes and daggers for teeth. His reputation for inflicting pain and suffering is legendary. He is a vile beast who thirsts for blood and he scares me. I pray we can get in and out without him finding us. So far, so good. We slowly, quietly walk up the old porch stairs. One of them creaks and we stop moving. Fanny stirs, but doesn't wake from her deep slumber. We walk across the porch and up to the back door. Freddy hops up into the mail slot and goes inside. I hear him fiddling with the lock, and he twists the knob, and the door slowly opens with a creak. I enter the house. Where is Penelope? I close the door. Guess she's staying out there. Okay. Well, we're in. Now what? I walk toward the fridge and realize that I'm empty-handed. I stop. We need to get something to carry the stuff back with, I say. We sneak around for a bit, and I open one of the cupboards. Pans crash out of the door, and there is a loud ruckus. Oh no! I gasp. I try to shut the door, but the damage has been done. What was that? I hear the farmer ask. Who's in the kitchen? We have to get out of here. There is a knock at the window. On the other side of the glass, Penelope is motioning for us to get out. Then I hear it. A deep, evil growl. Dread. I can hear the click of his long nails on the wooden floor. He's sniffing around, just outside the kitchen. I glance at Freddy. He looks ready to pass out. I can smell the vile beast as it gets closer. His breath is hideous. I don't know what to do. I feel trapped. There is a small creaking noise, and I see that Penelope has flown into the kitchen through the mail slot. She gives us a stern look and floats over the head of the great beast. He growls and lunges for her. She floats out of the way, just in time. Then, she flies out of the kitchen, and we can hear the beast go after her. Go, I say, and Freddy and I dash to the back door and slip outside. We run across the porch. Hey, where are you going? We've awoken Fanny, but I don't even bother turning around. I just keep running. The back door opens and loudly whacks the side of the house. Dreadnought, sick him! Freddy and I scramble to the edge of the property. Just ahead is the electric fence. Dreadnought dives off the porch and chases us. I'm gonna kill you and eat you for dinner. Help! Freddy makes it to the fence first and dives right through it. He makes it to the other side safe. I can hear the beast behind me getting closer with every step. Come and get me. Penelope teases the great beast, but his attention is on me. I slide under the fence and lightly brush the fence with my tail. A small electric shock flows through my body and I feel sick to my stomach. Behind me, I hear Dreadnought sliding to a halt in the dirt. Even he isn't stupid enough to touch that fence. One of these days, 
You'll slip up, and I'll eat you alive.